Hello class, this is Criminology, the Core, Chapter 4, Rational Choice Theory. After this chapter, you will be able to describe the development of rational choice theory, explore the concepts of rational choice, interpret the evidence showing that crime is rational, discuss the elements of situational crime prevention, analyze the elements of general deterrence, and discuss the basic concepts of specific deterrence. Roots in classical criminology were developed by Cesare Beccaria. He said that criminals are rational beings who plan crimes and criminals are deterred solely by fear of punishment. This was influential for more than 100 years, but positivist criminology took over by the end of the 19th century. When thinking about crime, people like James Q. Wilson produced a more contemporary version of the classical theory based on intelligent thought processes and criminal decision making. Becker argued that criminals engage in cost-benefit analysis. Here's an activity for you. Discuss the underlying assumptions about human decision making espoused by Cesare Beccaria and Gary Becker. What are the importance of these assumptions for the classical theory of crime? Rational choice theory believes that criminals engage in careful thought and planning, so they evaluate the risks of crime. If the rewards are high and perceived risk is small, then crime is likely. Then there is the offense-specific and offender-specific crime. Offense-specific when offender is when the offender reacts selectively to characteristics of a specific criminal act. Offender-specific is when offenders decide if they have personal needs, skills, and prerequisites to commit successful criminal acts. Then there's structuring criminality. This is considering personal factors and conditions prior to crime. Peer and guardianship play one role. Effective monitoring by parents reduces the likelihood that children will commit crime. Gender differences in crime may be explained by levels of guardianship and peer influence. Also, the criminal sometimes feels the compulsion for excitement and thrills. There can also be an economic need or opportunity where the offender needs money or there's an attraction to potential big money acquisition, but the reality is that crime pays less than criminals believe and they generally lack confidence and experience to carry out a crime successfully. Then there's structuring crime, where crime occurs and the characteristics of the target. They choose the place of the crime. In other words, criminals carefully choose where to commit the crime. They choose target. In that, market forces can shape their decision making. Burglars check to make sure no one is home before burglarizing a home and then they want to make sure that they're getting away. So criminals plan effective exit strategies. Here's another activity for you. Imagine you're a burglar. What target would you choose? And is your choice of target rational? Why or why not? Now, is crime truly rational? Is drug use rational? Initially, Drug use appears to be rationally chosen. Drug dealing is a business suggesting a level of rationality. Is violence rational? Violent criminals choose suitable targets who are vulnerable. Robbers choose victims in areas where they know the escape routes. Is hate crime rational? Three factors trigger hate crimes. One incident leaves one group with a grievance against another. Two, a definable target group is held responsible for a certain deed. And three, an event is known to the broad general public. Is sex crime rational? Johns make careful and rational decisions and share their knowledge and expertise on the internet. And then there's analyzing rational choice theory. Criminologist Joseph Agnew argues that social concern and self-interest exist together, thereby allowing for a natural restraint against crime. Now we're going to discuss situational crime prevention. This helps eliminate or reduce particular crimes in specific settings. The potential targets are carefully guarded, the means to commit crime are controlled, and potential offenders are carefully monitored. There also has to be defensible space. 
So a physical environment should be modified to reduce the opportunity that individuals have to commit crime. Then there's the CRAVID model. This stands for conceivable, removable, available, valuable, enjoyable, and disposable, and has proven to be a useful model to explain various forms of theft. No attempt has been made to apply this model to interpersonal crimes. The current study proposes that the CRAVID model may be used not only to explain theft, but also patterns of sexual homicide. Therefore, the aim of the study is to attempt to use the Craven model in order to explain the differences between the sexual homicide of children and sexual homicide of adults. When it comes to crime prevention strategies, there should be an increased effort that is needed to commit the crime. In other words, put unbreakable glass on storefronts. Also, increase the risk of committing crime, i.e. discourages crime. There should be guardians, handlers, and managers. In other words, a store is much less likely to be shoplifted the more personnel it has out on the sales floor. Reduce the awards of crime, e.g. indelible identification marks on bicycles, etc. Induce guilt, increase shame e.g. publishing quote-unquote John lists in the newspaper. Reduce provocation, e.g. institute earlier closing times in bars. And remove excuses, e.g. flashing lights with a car's speed as it's passed. Then there's evaluating situational crime prevention. There are hidden benefits. First is diffusion, which are efforts to prevent one crime unintentionally prevent another. Discouragement, where crime control efforts targeting one locale help reduce crime in surrounding areas and population. There are hidden costs. Displacement means that crime control in one area moves crime to another area. Extinction means short-term positive effects of crime reduction program dissipate as criminals adjust to new conditions. And replacement, where crime criminals try new offenses to replace those neutralized by crime prevention efforts. Here's another activity for you. A woman who applies for a restraining order against her abusive husband, boyfriend, or stalker must reveal her home address. The purpose is to allow the court to order the offender to stay away from the woman's home as required by the restraining order. But what problems might arise with this requirement? If you had a stalker and you were fairly certain that he or she did not know your home address, would you file for a restraining order? Why or why not? Now let's look at a brief analysis of the elements of general deterrence. Increased real or perceived threat of criminal punishment is one factor. Perception and deterrence are other factors where perception of forthcoming punishment influences criminality and perception changes and evolves over time. Then there's marginal and restrictive deterrence. Marginal deterrence occurs when a relatively more severe penalty produces some reduction in crime. Restrictive or partial deterrence refers to situations in which the threat of punishment can reduce but not eliminate crime. The offender reduces the number of crimes over time. The offender commits crime of lesser seriousness. The offender engages in situational measures to avoid detection or the offender recognizes risky situational context, so commits crime elsewhere. Now let's talk about punishment and deterrence. Where there's a certainty of punishment, there is a relationship between crime rates and certainty of punishment. As far as the severity of punishment, there is little consensus that strict punishment alone can reduce crime. When it comes to swiftness of punishment, the more rapidly punishment is applied after a crime, the more likely it is to serve as a deterrent. When evaluating general deterrence, four factors are involved. Rationality, system effectiveness, criminals discount punishments, and some offenders and crimes are more quote unquote deterrable than others. The view that criminal sanctions should be so powerful that offenders will never repeat their criminal acts is highly debatable. 
Punishment should be severe enough that criminals will not commit another criminal act, but many offenders recidivate. The effect of incarceration on rearrest sometimes appears to be minimal. So should punishment be toughened or not? That's an ongoing debate in society to this day. Inmates serving long sentences are less likely to recidivate. Why is the evidence mixed? Well, it may boil down to a few factors. Punishment may breed defiance. There is a stigma of being an offender. Experiencing harsh punishment may lead to psychological problems. And the effect of punishment is negligible in neighborhoods where almost everyone has a criminal record. There is the incapacitation effect which suggests that putting offenders behind bars during prime crime years should reduce crime. Of course, this is theoretical. Advocates of incapacitation suggest growth in prison jail population is directly responsible for a decade-long decline in the crime rate, but not all criminologists agree with incapacitation effect for various reasons. Incarceration and crime rate relationships may not be linear or predictable. At other times, crime rate increases have coincided with increasing incarceration rates. When it comes to criminal justice and rational choice theory, focused crackdowns are more effective than routine police patrols. Focused deterrence activates or pulls every deterrent quote-unquote lever. The three strikes and you're out sentencing policy is one of those focused deterrent activities and it appeals to public sentiment but it may be a premature method it's only been in effect for about 30 35 years and that's just not quite long enough for us to know how totally effective it is class that's all we have for this chapter thank you as always for your time if you have any concerns or questions please do not hesitate to contact your instructor again thank you and we'll see you next class